All right, if you're watching this on YouTube, I know most of you listen to this podcast on your favorite podcasting app, and you know what we always say. Wherever you are, give us a rating and review, or if you're at YouTube, subscribe, say something good about us. But if you're watching on YouTube, you're probably seeing two, one old guy and one older middle-aged guy. Uh, now, you know which one is the old guy. It is, this is, it is your host, Tom Rayner. But, you know, you probably recognize the other guy because we have done so much together in the past. And we have – I've been at his place. Uh, we have had it on numerous podcasts. The relationship between Vanderbloom and Search and particularly the person of William Vanderbloom and, and Church Answers and Tom Rayner is so incredibly strong. William, I'm going to welcome you and make that official. But I, I can remember – people saying, now, is it Vanderbloom and Rainer or is it Rainer Vanderbloom? And I always assured them it was Vanderbloom and Rainer. It was in reverse. It was in reverse order. So <laughs> I don't know how many times I've heard that in the past. So welcome to this podcast. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's been too long and, and great to see you. And I'm sure your listeners know to, you know, only believe a fraction of what you say when you say nice things about people. But, uh, Oh, it's, it's, you're very kind. Actually, my <laughs> listeners know that what I say is probably dead on because sometimes <laughs> I don't hold back on some things. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. William, there's so many things I want to talk about. I know you got a new book out called Be the Unicorn, and I just, I, I, I am excited about that. I am just incredibly excited about talking about that book. But I also want to just ask you what's going on in the world of search? You yep. are the expert in the world of search. So, you know, tell tell me what's going on there. Well, you know, uh, I can tell you about our part of the world of search, and that's trying to help any part of Team Jesus find their key leaders. You know, so it's churches, it's schools, it's nonprofits, it's the Chick-fil-A's of the world, for lack of a better way of saying it. And th that's something that's still fairly new for our part of the world. You know, in church and new ideas don't don't always get along. I I mean, like ask Jesus. Oh, uh, it it, it, yes. it, it it tends to take a while for churches to latch onto something new. So here's what's new in the world of search that I work in. I thought when I started this 15 years ago that maybe if I got to do it for 30 years, when I'm irrelevant, need to go do something else, I could look back and I could say, now that new idea is finally becoming normal for normal sized churches, right? Yeah. yeah. And we were well on path to do that. But, and then this pandemic happened. And I don't know, uh, time will tell, Tom, but, but I get the sense that, you know, the pandemic was awful. We don't want to do that again. But there's a silver lining to that pandemic for churches. In a lot of ways, it was what I consider to be a great accelerator. So, like, it accelerated churches like my mother's church, which is a wonderful church that's slightly older than George Washington and has a couple hundred people come on the blood of Jesus red carpet with beautiful white columns. Um, I was a charter member. If you'd have told Exactly. And and it's wonderful. But if you they had a brand new minister when the pandemic hit and if he had tried to do live stream worship, he would have gotten eaten alive. Yeah, but when yeah. the pandemic hit, when the pandemic hit, everybody's like, well, why don't we try that? Same with people who do digital giving. It was becoming normal. Now it's completely normal. I think in search. We got a little accelerator from the pandemic, I think. Search is now a very normal first step for normal sized churches. And I say that really intentionally because I, I love serving the big church. We, we serve most of the largest churches in North America, and that's great. But well over half our work now is for churches that are under 300 in attendance, which is still a large church. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're not bivocational and only two digits in worship, you're not a small church. And, and it just right. does my heart good to see the church of 200 that's still printing bulletins every week, that has a printed newsletter, uh, writing something about how we're going to be helping find their pastor. Because, that man, you, you help a county seat church in a in a just out in the breadbasket of America, you can make a big difference. And so that's, that's a lot more than you wanted to hear, but that's kind of fun thing. It's, it is, it is affirming, confirming of 
our observations too, and we see it on search as well. And one data point is if you have an attendance above 250, you're in the top 7% in the nation. So, you know, what we used to call mid-sized churches, they're big churches now. That that has changed right. dramatically. And William, I do see a greater receptivity to what is should have been a normal future before the pandemic. And I include search, digital giving, and other things that really help the church. I mean, some someone will, you know, will ask me, um, what is the search going to cost me? If I go to Vanderbilt, what's going to cost me? I said, it's going to cost you a lot more if you don't go to Vanderbilt. That's, that, that's, <laughs> I, I often quote you, the, the, the worst hire you can make is the wrong hire. And it, so, you know, get the right person on the front on the front end. And they're not asking me the questions as much anymore. And they're saying, okay, we're, we're open to it. So I yeah, like well, it. I, really, I think that's right. And I, I hate like selling out of fear or negativity. But I think people, you know, the, the metaphor that's really stuck in my soul about what I think God's called us to do is, you know, it's like I've got one kingdom, many locations. And in those locations, there need to be organ transplants from time to time. And, you know, I've talked mm-hmm. about that image before. You know, you got to find the donor. You got to find a tissue match. I don't know anyone who, when they need a new kidney, says, goes and Googles, discount organ transplant. <laughs> that is a great metaphor. <laughs> you just don't do it. You, you, why in the world? <laughs> you know, there are places yes. for discount. I want discount tires, <laughs> discount car wash, discount lots of things, but I don't want a discount kidney transplant. So I, I it's, it's, interesting. <laughs> it's just interesting <laughs> to see uh how God took a, a really horrible thing and and accelerated a lot of churches through it. Oh, uh, that's not to you minimize a lot of bad things, a lot of suffering, but man, there's some fruit out there. All right, let's switch to the book. Be the unicorn. Yep. You know, some of my listeners, maybe a lot of them, don't know what a unicorn is. And even though it's been pervasive in the business and investment world uh, to, 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 to see this coming from William Vanderbilt. You got to, you got to talk about what a unicorn is other than yeah. a mythological animal. Well, you know, it's so funny. I probably shouldn't title books. I probably should have run it through chat GPT or something, uh, but it probably should have been called how to stand out of the crowd. Uh, Cause that's really what, what, what we were asking you know, and, and just give you a little origin story. The book happened largely because of the pandemic. You say, well, why? Well, we talked for a long time about trying to, you know how you ever interview somebody or meet somebody at a party or a church event and like you spend five minutes with them and you just go, this one's special. Yeah. This one. I yeah. Now I've, I've learned that doesn't mean I should go hire them, but <laughs> you, there's just something that stands out. And we've said forever, could we figure out what that is among the people we interview? Well, then the pandemic came and, you know, I don't have a, a business degree. I've got back here a religion and philosophy degree and then a seminary degree. And and okay. I don't know well, if that's, you know this. That's, that's marginally helpful. Well, you know, most people that have a philosophy degree spend their career saying, would you like fries with that? So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I don't oh, know business, but, but here's one thing I learned in the pandemic. If every one of your clients has to close their doors indefinitely, your calendar is going to get free. <laughs> so, all the, yeah, churches closed, schools closed, and and we did a, we pivoted and did a lot of things to serve churches, but it did give us time to go and do some hard research. So we started asking these questions about people that stand out because we've met a lot of them, and we said, okay, uh, so in a search, uh, you. First Baptist Church of Slap Out, Alabama, which is actually a town. I'm sure you've been through, Tom. Oh, uh, they call us and say, I, "Well, it, I it's there. there." I've heard, I've heard about it, but I, I have not been there. Yeah. Well, it, you know, they call and they say, "Okay, we need help finding our pastor." Great. So we're working for one church. We probably are going to have hundreds and hundreds of people that show some interest in this, right? And then it's our job to get down to the few and then let the committee with the Holy Spirit figure out like who is the right person here. From the hundreds, 
we'll do sermon reviews. We'll have initial phone calls and we're narrowing it down and it's dozens and then Zoom interviews or whatever platform you use. And, and then you get down to the people you're like, I think we're down to our short list. We're down to the last six or 10 for this search. And when you get to that level, then people get a very long face to face interview with us. OK. We realized in the pandemic. We've now done 30,000 of those face to face interviews. Wow. And, and we've tracked and we've tracked them. They've all been on the same basic template. So it's not the same questions every time, but it's the same flow. Right. And we said to ourselves, OK, that's a 30 that 30,000 is the best that we've interfaced with within those 30,000. Is there a way to figure out who the best of those were? And, you know, did they get the job? Are they still in the job? Are they performing well? Are they, you know, that sort of thing. And, and we figured out who they were. And then we said, do those people have anything in common? And the answer was yes. Hmm. And we distilled it down to 12 distinct traits that these best of the best had. And so we could have said stand out in a crowd or whatever, but my daughter actually said, that's like they talk about unicorns in the business world. You know, we want to find the next mythical creature that's so amazing that you don't even think it really exists. And I thought, well, that's not real bright. But then another one of my kids said, Dad, for 15 years, people have been paying you to find the unicorn for their staff. Exactly. Exactly. So I thought about it. I thought, well, I'm still learning. I got every day I'm learning. Um, but I think we do have pretty good pretty good track record so far of finding unicorns. And now, now I can teach you to become one, not just yeah. find them. Cause That's the cool thing point. about the, the cool thing about the 12 traits is Tom, I thought, I thought, okay, what's going to be a common trait. They all had an IQ of over 150. Nope. Um, uh, what's going to be a common trait. They're all six feet tall with blonde hair and amazing teeth, you know, uh, mm. no, not, not it. Uh, they all, all went to Ivy League schools. They all had a bachelor's. Nope, not it. It was 12 habits that we saw them uh, all exemplify that were, on the one hand, really common among the best of the best. And on the other hand, really uncommon among the general population. And they're not wow. hard to do. They're just not hard. So instead of you saying can, you can stand out of crowds, you know what? You can be a unicorn. I like the unicorn metaphor. I mean, it's, it's time for the church world to learn that as well as for the business world. So whether, whether you're working for a nonprofit, I mean, you are searching for a nonprofit or you're searching for a business or you're searching for a church. All of them are looking for their unicorn. And That's what right. is their unicorn may be different than what is someone else's unicorn. But in well, it, it every almost, it, al it. it almost wasn't titled Unicorn. The publishers wanted something more business-ish. And I just kind of yelled and screamed and said, sorry. Because because I, I went to a conference and I asked all the speakers at this conference, do you like Title A or Title B? And Title A was this sort of businessy, and Title B, they all picked Unicorn. I'm like, uh, I come home, I get into the walk in our front door there's a little office where adrian runs the world and on top of her desk is the latest shipment from amazon and it was a float for the pool for the summer because we usually pop the one from the year before and it was a freaking unicorn and I'm there like, is okay. your sign that's it <laughs> Jesus amazon Jesus. had a plastic <laughs> unicorn in the mail William Van der Blumen, that is that is everything that you need on that. I love I actually love I actually love the title. All right, we're talking about Be the Unicorn by William Van der Blumen. Uh you can see it in your show notes. We got the link there. Uh buy it, get it. You're going to be blessed. We could talk about so many of these traits. I, I, I kind of want to go to this one, William. Uh the unicorns have a strong sense of purpose. And mm -hmm. they get into organization and they align that purpose. Talk about this purpose thing and unicorns. Yeah. Well, this is so cool because it's the one place that the people we interview, all of them, test out higher than the general population. You know, we're working for people 
interested in moving Jesus' kingdom forward, right? So yeah. they're already sort of hardwired into this. And then our, our buddy Rick helped everybody think about their purpose <laughs> for yeah. years and years and years. So I, I think we were a little ahead of the game. It was really refreshing to see that within people in, in Christian vocation, whether that's at Chick-fil-A or in a church or wherever, uh, they really are driven by, I want to make a difference with my life. And what we found was the general population – that thought doesn't even cross their mind when they go to their job. So sad. it is sad. And I think that's why, you know, most studies I read show that over half of America actually hates their job. Not, hmm. oh, I'm disengaged, but they really hate it. And uh, my hope is this will be a place where some of the, some of the, the kingdom pieces of this book will bleed into the business community. Because if you can show, you know, in an interview that you've studied the purpose, let's take it to churches. Every church should have some local expression of the Great Commission somewhere in their, you know, work. If you do an interview and somebody studied how you're applying that to your particular context and they can say, I have felt called that way, that's amazing. I mean, for instance, our mutual friend, Eric Geiger, who is a unicorn. I, I talked to him, and I, I think he's I think he's a double horn unicorn. I just think he's really rare. <laughs> and and by the really way, rare. listeners and viewers, just just want you to know, William stole Eric from me. <laughs> he stole Eric from me. I was CEO of Lifeway. I was I was getting ready to retire and transition out, and I thought that uh, Eric was going to be my heir apparent. A lot of people did. I said, this is going to be cool. Just going to pass the baton. And who gets in the middle of all of this except William Vanderblumen? Now, he did it with integrity. He asked. As a matter of fact, he asked me who I recommended. And I said, well, I hate to say this, but I actually recommended yeah. because yeah. I knew that a church like Mariners needed a unicorn. And there aren't many Eric Geigers around. I, I'm sorry. I'm spoiling your story. I just I, I no, have a little you're, anger. You're fine. I want to share with you. No, I go on and off people's Christmas card lists very regularly. It's no no offense. I'm, I, I serve Jesus. <laughs> and I, I just want to make sure he's good with where people are moving around, not me. And the cool thing about interviewing Eric, I love him. Um, and you told that story just right. You know, you really should get the credit for naming that. But uh when I talked to him, he said he was with his daughter in Southern California when I texted him about this. And he said uh, his daughter had said, what are we doing when Dr. Rayner retires? I don't know if you've heard this story. And and this gets to this trait of purpose driven. He said, well, uh, and I, I don't think he'd mind me telling this story. He said, well, I think, you know, one of three things I can think would happen. Uh, we hadn't talked about Mariners. All he said, I could you know, there, there's going to be a new CEO at Lifeway and they might come in and they may, they may want me to work for them. They may not. I don't know. We'll have to see if that works. Uh, it might be that I take over for Dr. Rayner. I don't know. That, that, and I guess the only other thing I can think of is I might go back to serving the local church, but it would have to be somewhere just like this, <laughs> which is right where Mary is. And I said, Eric, you did not say that. And he said, yes. And I said, why that? Because the beach and you heard Jesus' voice in the waves, you know, and he said, no, 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 no. Everything I've done leading up till now, I need to be in a city, but not in the center of the city. I need to be on the fringes where there's growth. That's what I know how to do if I were to go to a church. It needs to be a city of influence where I can reach people that will influence others. That's what I'm good at. That's what I do. Um, you know, frankly, it needs to be a city that's getting to ready to go through a major uh, ethnicity shift because that's what I did in Miami. And mm -hmm. this place is about to go through that shift. This place. So he was so keen on how God had used him that he could say more than just, I want to work for Jesus. He could say, I know how I can get some work done for Jesus. It would have to be something like this. And I said, well, that's actually what I'm calling you about. Uh, so, uh, oh, it, you know, that, goodness. that sense of, if I were to serve, here's where God's used me before, and I want to use that purpose. That's that's unicorn right there. Very few people are able to articulate at that level. You, you've seen you've seen the illustrations of an angel on one shoulder and a demon on the other, or maybe Satan on the other, trying to influence you. I really wanted to listen to that demon, that, that <laughs> devil, 
And because there was this whisper in my ear saying, lie, lie. Don't don't mention it. Just don't mention it. And I couldn't do it. And the angel over here said, tell him the truth. And let God work it out. And I said, well, sounds like probably Eric Geiger is the best person I could think of this. And I said, what did I just say? And he just, uh, that's he just as we record this, he just had his five year anniversary yesterday. And just I saw all the pictures, the staff blessing him and the elders. And uh, you did a good thing. I know I did. I know I did. And it was as painful as it was at the time. I wanted to be self-serving. I wanted to just be able to hand it off to someone that I knew would be competent and be a unicorn at Lifeway. But hey, God has his own plans and and I'm fine with that. We got to wind this up. These these man, we, we do 21 minute interviews or 21 minute podcast, uh, William. So it's so short. I want to give you the opportunity just to wrap it up any way you want to, because. Yeah, uh, uh, well, questions I, <clears> answer, <throat> and I got. Welcome. You know what I think I'd like to do? I, I think I'd like to um, help your listeners out. So, you know, we're launching a book. So there's always like if you buy the book, you get something. If you pre-order the book, you get some bonus content. The, here's here's a cool thing. You can't tell everybody this, right? This is the Rainer secret intel. And uh, mm-hmm. w- we took since we gathered all this data three years ago, we hired some applied math people. We hired some psychologists. We hired some coders. And we've actually built an index around these 12 traits that people can take. And they'll be able to see, how do I measure up against the general respondents? And how do I measure up against the top 1%? Mm. And then teams can take it together in a 360 format where we can see, where are we good as a team? And where do we need to get better as a team in it. these simple habits? So I, I think... Probably we need to do like a discount code for the Rainer audience. Anybody who pre-orders a book will send you, you know, a, a way to take that assessment and and not have to pay the the fee that's usually there. That sounds great. I will have if you will have your people call my people. My people would be Alana. Alana. So Alana will uh, get that and she'll put it in the show notes because this does not air to November fourteenth. If I'm looking correctly at the that's great at the information. well the, that by then there will be ten thousand data points in that uh, survey and we cor- we surveyed a quarter million people as well. So it's really well thought out and it's going to be a super good tool even for churches where it's like I'm the only guy on staff. Well, your key volunteers y'all can figure exactly. out where are you shining as a unicorn and where could you. Go get some volunteers that are a little better at some of the places you need backfilled. Uh, exactly. Well, we we started off this conversation. You made the comment it had been too long since we had talked. It has been, and it's been too long since I've had you on Rainer on Leadership. So promise you'll come back again. Anytime. Yeah. Thanks Thank for having you. me, Tom. We'll, Appreciate it. As always. And always thanks to California Baptist University. They got this cool thing going on at California Baptist Many universities say, hey, if you're in high school, you can take college courses. They do that, but they say you can take them digitally at your own pace. But when you're in the classroom, you're taking it with other college students, not just high school students. So if you are a sophomore, junior, senior in high school and you want to get some college credit, California Baptist. Now, here's a good deal. The really stuff you can do the first course free and every subsequent course, instead of paying six hundred thirteen dollars a credit hour, you pay one hundred and sixty six a credit hour. Incredible. Wow. And then you can do up to 30 courses, 30 courses. We love California Baptists. We love their mission. We love their ministry. We love their education. So I would encourage you to look at the show notes, uh, calbaptist.edu slash PCC, and look at that information about this new program. As always, we love William Vanderblumen. We love Vanderblumen Search. We are advocates of them. So check them out. Everything's in the show notes. Get the book. You heard about the offer that he just made. Get that. And we will see you in the next edition of Rainer on Leadership. Hey, folks, this is a PS to our podcast. We got some exciting stuff that we want to offer you absolutely for free. Sam, when you think about predictive factors in, in, in a church's growth, if you take out demographics, what are some things that come to mind? Just just two. I mean, don't give me a list of 10, just just two or three things that come to mind on predictive growth of a church. Well, evangelism and whether okay. the church is doing it or not. Bingo. And then I, and then, and then I will add is in an ongoing evangelism emphasis. Double bingo, well. double, and maybe something about leadership and their commitment to that. So all of the above. Evangelistic churches have evangelistic pastors. Is it, the staff, is the lead pastor 
doing the work themselves. We have a free download for you, and it's actually a sheet that you can self-score. You answer 20 questions anywhere from uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree, and we come back and we predict what your growth rate is going to be for the next year in worship attendance. It's not a perfect tool, but it's a good tool. There's a link to that for the, for the attendance predictor. Look in the show notes. You'll absolutely love it. That's cool. We'll see you soon.